Oh, wow. I love that message uh, just to know that we are loved. Isn't that great? If we capture nothing else, uh, we've succeeded in uh, our time together today. I want to say hello and welcome and good morning. So I'm just going to say good morning and then have you repeat maybe back to me the same greeting. Good morning. Oh man, you were powerful. That was very good. I appreciate that. My name is Doug Houston. I serve as one of the pastors here in town and together uh, along with my wife, Maureen, who's on your left uh, over here, we're pleased to be here. Uh, We've been friends with Greg and Teresa for many, many, many years. Uh, uh, My wife reminded me that uh, when Teresa was a college girl, she actually lived with us for a period of time. Is that right? No? No, she didn't. Okay. Never mind. That was different. That was seven other college kids that seemed to live with us. Uh, Greg was my uh, junior high intern when I was youth pastor. Uh, So when he was in college, uh, and I'll just tell you, you have not just a good pastor, you have a stellar pastor and uh, great leadership at this church. And so what a privilege to be with you. Uh, You are fulfilling uh, a God-honoring, white-hot purpose in uh, this area and around the world. Great to hear about the James Project starting again, uh, making a difference with people that uh, desperately need help from a church like this. Uh, Also, uh, just great to know you're making a difference around the world. You'll hear about uh, the opportunity to write some encouraging notes to some of your missionaries later on the patio. And so what a joy to be with you. Well, my wife and I, um, a little bit about us. Uh, uh, We have four grown children um, and uh, three of them are in the area. Three of them are married. uh, And one of them is still available. uh, Keanu, 27 years old in Bible College in Alabama. I'll be taking applications later if there's someone interested. Uh, Which one is he? Uh, Far left, uh, upper right picture. There you go, uh, ladies. Anyway, uh, my wife and I, uh, um, after our worship time together, will be available with your elders for prayer for anyone who would like that. If you've gone through, um, maybe in this season, the loss of a loved one, I'd love to put something in your hands for free. Um, A woman in uh, our church wrote a very uh, encouraging book that I think could help you with uh, the grief and the loss you're experiencing. See me afterwards. I'd love to make that available to you uh, for free. Now, we not only have four adult children, even better, get ready for this, we have three grandchildren. Oh, yeah, some of you, you understand the joy there, right? Okay, so when you were in biology class, you learned your heart has how many? Four chambers? until you receive a grandchild and you grow a fifth. That's right, a new capacity to love, and we have one living with us right now, which is awesome. Um, other things happening in the Houston world, uh, uh, just recently, about a month and a half ago, my wife got to uh, uh, take her mortarboard, move the uh, little uh, piece over there, and graduated with a biblical studies degree, so congratulations to uh, my wife, uh, very good. Now we have a Bible scholar in the house, which is really helpful. Uh, Me, I'm about to say a word to you. This word could make you shudder in your uh, seat. It could run a cold streak up your spine. So I just want to warn you so you don't, uh, you know, like overreact. Here's the word. Are you ready for it? Brace yourself. Lawyer. Oh, oh, it's hurt. You're like, oh my goodness, yeah. And I just say that word not to horrify you, but to let you know that about a year and a couple months ago, I swore into the California bar, uh, now as a California attorney. Uh, it was a nice accomplishment. I see you're giving me a courtesy clap. Thank you. I'm just interested in helping people in a different way. I'll always be a pastor, uh, but it's nice to be an attorney helping people uh, as well. Um, it seems to be running in our family, though, which is kind of interesting. By the way, at some point in your life, you're going to need an attorney. Right? I don't know what'll happen. Maybe you have a car accident, maybe something like that. So uh, I have a lot of attorney jokes, but you know what? We have some value as well. Uh, Some of you remember the um, famous song by Willie Nelson. It kind of goes, Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be attorneys. Uh, I mean, cowboys, right? Uh, My mom uh, uh, had three boys. All three became attorneys. My younger brother, 34 years ago, then my older brother, Jimbo. And then, um, if that weren't enough, uh, I told you I swore into the bar uh, a little over a year ago. And then I've got my nephew, Jake. He's an attorney. And guess what? My other nephew just finished law school. He'll take the bar. So no family needs five attorneys. Uh, Oh, help us. It's time for you to earn lunch from the person next to you. Are you ready? Uh, If you guess correctly, you can make a wager with them. I told you my mom had three boys that grew up to be attorneys. They're all babies at one point. Uh, But which one am I? If you can guess correctly, bet against the person next to you. Go ahead and take a moment. Do you think I'm the one on the far right, the one on the far left, the one in the middle? Take a moment, share with your neighbor, and it's lunch on the line. This is Miguel's Jr. Go ahead, make your wager. You got it? Did you even try? All right, here we go. Uh, Am I the one on the right? 
No, that's my brother Jim. He's the prettiest of all of us. Yeah. Uh, am I the one in the middle? No, that's Buddha Brad. He looks like a little Buddha there. Uh, that's my brother Brad, uh, the younger, stronger, smarter, richer one. Uh, so that leaves who? The one on the left. How many got it right? Half of you. Very good. That's better than the odds. Uh, go, you know, spend your lunch wisely. Uh, <clears throat> I want to pray real quick, and then we're going to get into maybe one of the simplest messages you've heard in a long time. This is an open-eyed prayer. You can pray it with me as I look at you. God, as we look into the scripture, I pray that you would speak to me. And if you speak, I will obey. For I prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a dangerous prayer, by the way. I'm glad you prayed it. Hope that you did. Today, we're talking about kingdoms in conflict. Kingdoms in conflict. You know, the Bible says that there's two kingdoms that exist. There's the kingdom of the world. You were born into that. It's the physical manifestation of a kingdom that we can see today, by the way. Uh, it's a kingdom ruled by a terrible king. It's Satan himself. The Bible says that uh, he is the God of this world. But there's a second kingdom, and that's the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. They exist simultaneously. Um, and we, if we become Christians, have to be translated out of that first kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of of light. And these kingdoms always have been, and in your life they will be in conflict. Um, I still remember when it happened for me. Uh, I was an 18 year old, uh, and uh, I had uh, been seeking after God, and I came out of that kingdom of darkness. Now, in the first two years that I became a believer, I want to just tell you this if you were another Christian around me, you would have given up on me. You would have determined, oh, that guy's a no hoper for sure. Because on the outside, not a whole lot looked like it was changing. To be honest, uh, God was sifting my life for some big and obvious sins, but what was really going on was happening inside my my heart and in my head, and there was significant transformation going on. Uh, I was definitely making the move into the kingdom of light. God was changing everything about me, the way that I perceived the world, the way that I thought, the values that I held. Um, all of it was changing on the inside, but it wouldn't really manifest itself for a couple of years, uh, and others could see that. And, and so I look around, and uh, there are so many people exactly where I was at that time. They are absolutely lost in our world. I think we have an entire generation that's largely lost. Have you noticed it? Do you see it? And, and by lost, I mean this. It was just like I was when I was 18 years old. I wasn't really sure where I was from. Now, I knew who my family was, but I didn't have any spiritual heritage at all that I uh, uh, had come into. Uh, I didn't know where I was from. I certainly didn't know where I was right? I was just moving uh, and being tossed with every thought of the day. And I certainly didn't know where I was going. That's lost. When you don't know where you're from, where you're at, or where you're going, you're triply lost. And I see a big part of our world like that today. Do you? Do you see it all around us? And so uh, we're going to talk about how it is that people can make their way from that kingdom of the world into the kingdom of God. You are um, a group of people who are probably all already in the kingdom of God, and I so hope that this message encourages you with clarity about what it means to be in the kingdom of God, but also activates you so that you begin to invite others into it as well. Uh, and so the story is so simple. You've heard it. Uh, lift your hand if you've ever heard the story about Zacchaeus in the Bible. Oh, so many of you have. Uh, don't make me sing the song. I'll do it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I love it. Good. We're done for the day. If you don't know the song, see me for the remediation course. I'm kidding. That's not it. Oh, but it is. That's our story. It's so familiar, so simple, but wait, it's going to be profound as well. The scene is Jericho. This takes place in Jericho, just a handful of miles outside of uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem's on the hill. It's down near the Dead Sea. Uh, the time is literally just days before Jesus will enter into Jerusalem for the very last time on the back of the foal of a donkey. It will start Passion Week. There'll be no turning back from that moment. It will take him straight to the cross. His listeners, three groups. He's got the disciples with him. These are the followers. These are the believers. He's been with them for two and a half years. Um, that's the first group. But then there's the greater crowd that's not sure about him. They're still making up their mind. And then there's a third group. 
These are the religious leaders who were contrary and against him. They'd already been placed at the outpost beyond Jerusalem to intersect him when he was coming to Jerusalem, and they were waiting for him in Jericho as well. The purpose of his communication, twofold. One, to show the contrast of the two kingdoms and invite people into uh, that kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. He wanted to clarify that and extend an invitation in. Uh, This is the last time Jesus will pass through Jericho. Um, You probably remember what happened before he got there. Just on the outskirts of Jericho, a couple things happened. He encounters someone whom you know in your Bible as the rich young ruler. Lift your hand if you recognize that term, the rich young ruler. And the encounter does not end up so good. Uh, He wants to know how does he get into the kingdom of God. Poses a question to Jesus. And Jesus puts something before him. He says to him, hey, listen, uh, go and sell all that you have and come follow me. That's what you need to do. And do you remember what happened? He rejected that invitation, walked away. Jesus chased him for three blocks. No, wait, the Bible doesn't say that. Jesus did not change him for three blocks, uh, chase him. Instead, Jesus had a private conversation, a debrief with his disciples. His disciples were perplexed. They looked and they said, oh my goodness. Uh, Jesus says, it is so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Remember why he went away discouraged? He was very wealthy. He didn't want to give away all he had and follow Jesus. And then the the, the disciples said, Jesus, if, if a guy like that, rich, young, ruler, can't get into the kingdom, what hope do we have? To which Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But remember, with God, all things are possible. And so that's happening on the encounter on the way into Jericho. And just a few steps after that, Jesus starts to tell them again, I have to go to the cross. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be killed. And the Bible says something very, very sad. The disciples did not understand it. And so Jesus left alone, lonely with the knowledge of what's ahead. And then third thing happens. He's almost to the gate of the Jericho now, and he sees off a a, a little to the side a man born blind. Never has anyone ever healed somebody born blind, but Jesus does it. In God's mercy, he heals this man. And then in such wonderful humility, Jesus simply says to him, it's your faith that made you well. Now, it was the power of God that made him well, but Jesus, demonstrating that beautiful uh, humility, says that. By the way, it won't be the only time he heals one born blind. He'll do it at the pool of Siloam as well. And so our story begins then in Luke chapter 19. If you have your Bible on your phone, feel free to reference it. If you've memorized your Bible, sit back and relax. It's your benefit you've earned for memorizing your entire Bible. Um, Why is it that people are so lost today? I think part of it is a reflection of our current modern day culture. There's a lot of people just like I was when I was younger who had no church background at all. They've never been in a church. They've never heard the gospel. Public education hasn't helped at all. Social media reveals everything contrary to the gospel and clouds the gospel lightly. Um, It is as if the gospel doesn't exist for some people in their sphere. They need someone to come in and offer what it is that we have. They're lost, and uh, it's profound. Some people um, uh, are just like Zacchaeus, though. We're going to encounter Zacchaeus, and uh, he's a fascinating character. His name means pure and innocent. Isn't that wonderful? Except for he's nothing like that right now, is he? Oh, there might have been a day he was pure and innocent, the day he was born, but now he's not. He's a traitor to his own Jewish people. He's a a conspirer with the Roman government. He's a thief uh, and a crook. Uh, He is nothing in the way of pure and innocent anymore. But on top of that, he finds himself lonely Uh, and an outcast as well. He's a man that uh, has a conflict of kingdoms happening, not around him, but within him, within him. I wish it could be said that these two kingdoms are easy to define on a map. It would be nice to open up a map and go, here's the line of demarcation that shows the kingdom of the world, and over here is the kingdom of God. But that line isn't found on a map. It runs straight down the middle of every human being. And we have to reconcile the kingdoms in conflict. Some might ask this question, where is the kingdom of God? How many of you have children or grandchildren? Lift your hand. Okay, uh, this is going to be for you. At Someday they're going to come home from uh, 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 maybe their children's ministry or vacation Bible school. And they'll be talking about the kingdom of God. And then they're going to say this, mom, dad, grandpa, papa, uh, momo. Hey, where is the kingdom of God? I want you to have that answer. By the way, do you know where the kingdom of God is? 
The answer is so simple it may evade you. So I'll share it with you. Where is the kingdom of God? Simply wherever God is king. Doesn't that make sense to you? He could be the king of heaven. He certainly is. He's the king of my heart. He could be the king of my home, the king of my work. Wherever you've allowed him to be king becomes incorporated in to the kingdom of God. It steals that space and that area and that affection away from the kingdom of darkness. And so the kingdom of God is wherever God is king. Um, but how do you know you're in the kingdom of God? That's what we're going to see with this simple story. It's a hyperspeed example of what it looks like to be in the kingdom of God. Three things just have to be true of us. You, of me, if these three things are true of me, I'm in the kingdom of God. And the first is simply this, that at some point in my life, I have to be found by God. I have to be found by God. Listen to how our story starts. Luke 19 says that he, Jesus, entered Jer Jericho and he was passing through. Remember, he's on his way to Jerusalem. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus Catch this, he was a chief tax collector. He wasn't just an average tax collector. He'd gone all in with the Roman government, been promoted. He's like the head of the IRS in his area. And he was, as you might imagine, read it, rich. Don't forget that there was another man that Jesus encountered not much before that, that rich, young ruler. And so he sees the Zacchaeus here and says that Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on the account of the crowd, he could not. Why? Because he was a man of little, he was a little bit, kind of a shortcake. Uh, he couldn't see over the crowds uh, and such. But don't miss this idea that he had left the heritage that he had as a Jew turned his back on his own countrymen and became a traitor to them as a tax collector, absolutely hated now and outcast and separated from any sort of heritage he once had. Uh, he, he's not any longer in what temporarily at least represented somewhat of the kingdom of God. And now he's aligned with the Roman government, but he's not completely in with them. And he's really a man without countries. By the way, these two kingdoms in conflict, there is no dual citizenship. You must be part of one or the other. Jesus said, uh, you cannot serve two masters. You'll love one and you'll hate the other. Uh, if you choose to be friendship with the worldly kingdom, you'll be at enmity with God. And likewise, if you end up in God's kingdom, you will have to turn your back on the world. But this man was trying to ride the middle and it wasn't working out for him. Uh, Jesus, did you catch this? Jesus wants to invite us into his kingdom. Did you notice these words that, and he, Zacchaeus, was seeking to see who Jesus was. He was intrigued by him. Uh, he was one of the crowd at this moment, and he wanted to get a little closer and get a better look at him. Uh, and, and that's not a bad thing at all, because Jesus promised this. Those, those that would ask of him for something, he would give it. Ask, he said, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. These are spiritual truths. And he said, if you knock on the door, it will be open to you. God wants to invite us into that relationship. Um, but when did that first happen for you? When did God find you? You might think, well, that's an odd question. Uh, I, I would rather put it this way, Pastor Doug. When did I find Jesus? Well, that's not bad, but isn't it true that to whatever degree you were seeking him, in the end, you found out he was seeking you. It was he who found you, not you who found him. That's how it started with Zacchaeus. Uh, for me, I had the advantage in fifth grade, a Christian came into my life. I'd never had the opportunity really of having any church background before that. Um, but at fifth grade, a Christian came into my life. He began to live his life alongside me so I could see what it was like to know God. Uh, and then ultimately began to invite me to, to some church activities and such. Um, it was in that particular season, just when I was 18 years old, that I began to take some proactive steps to actually seek after God. Now, I thought uh, I was seeking after him with a pretty uh, intentional and pure heart. In the end, I realized it was half-baked and half-hearted. Thank God, at the same time, he was seeking me, almost like a hound of heaven, tracking me down and pulling me toward himself. Uh, it was at age 18, um, through the influence of a Christian friend, uh, that God found me. So the first thing, if you're in the kingdom of God, there's a time where 
God found you. You may have had a, been a person, though, who had the advantage of growing up in church, right? And so it seemed to you that you always knew about God and knew God. Oh, I hope so. What an advantage uh, for children like that. But isn't it true, even those who grow up with the benefit of church have some experience with God at some point. It might be in junior high camp. It could be later in high school where they go, oh my gosh, it's as if I'm even being reborn again. And now God has become personal and real to me. Uh, he found me. He found me. I'm completely his. Well, that's what I'm talking about. That's the first thing that has to be true. The second thing is we have to respond to that. We have to receive him. Look what happened with uh, Zacchaeus. In Luke 19.4, it goes on to say this. So Zacchaeus did it. He ran ahead of the crowd, climbed up into a sycamore tree. That's a fig tree, by the way, uh, so that he could see him. Um, because Jesus was about to pass that way. By the way, I have a sycamore fig in our front yard, um, and it's, uh, in like two and a half years, it's grown 25 feet tall. Uh, these are significant trees. The trunk is already about this big. You can climb a sycamore tree, uh, but I want to tell you, the branches are a little bit flimsy. And so I picture Zacchaeus, maybe you do, don't picture some pine tree that's all strong, right? He probably climbed up, got on it, and started leaning over. So he's probably about this height over Jesus. You know, Jesus isn't going to look up to see him and go, where are you? It's going to be like one of these, hey, buddy, <laughs> you're right there, you know? Um, and that's what happens. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down. I must stay at your house today. And so he did. He hurried and came down and catch this. And he what? received him joyfully. Uh, he's going to have lunch with Jesus. Um, but that idea of receiving him is the idea. Uh, it's not enough for God to find you. You have to respond to him. You have to receive him, embrace him into your life. Uh, the apostle John wrote it in the first chapter of that beautiful gospel of John this way, as many as received him, to them, God gives the power or right to become children of God or sons and daughters of God. Did you catch it? So we have to receive him into our life. And when we do, we're introduced then into the forever family of God, adopted into God's family. By the way, that's a permanent adoption, by the way, uh, that he uh, uh, transacts in our life. When did that happen for you? Can you define a moment, a season uh, where you received him? Uh, you absolutely knew that you belonged to him and he belonged to you. Or are you a person that's new to things of church and you're going, oh my goodness, this is really fascinating. I didn't know that experience awaits me. Oh, I'll tell you, you're in a great church to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. But there has to be a time where you receive him. Uh, for me, uh, culminating at, during that time when I was 18 years old, finished up high school, that same friend came to me on a sa uh, Saturday morning and he said, uh, hey, later on this afternoon, are you ready to go to that concert uh, with me? And I'm like, what concert did I agree to go to? And it was a Christian outreach concert. Uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't wake up that morning thinking I would go to a concert, but sure enough, that afternoon, he puts me in his car and we head to what was uh, then um, a Greg Laurie outreach event. How many are familiar with Harvest Crusades? This was Harvest Crusade before it ever had the title. Um, and so I'm like, oh, doggone it. He tricked me into this thing. Um, but I kind of wanted to go, but I, I really wasn't, uh, you know, expecting that. So we get in his car and we get to the concert. Guess what? When it's already over, there literally was the very last band on the stage playing the very last song. For some of you old people, the name of the uh, artist was Odin Fong. I just thought I'd throw that out for a little trivia for some of you. Uh, God bless you if you're as old as I am and you know that name. Anyway, but we get there, and then because everybody else has filled the entire Orange Show Fairgrounds, we're in the very last row, and the last song finishes. I'm like, huh. Then this balding preacher, Greg Laurie, comes out and starts preaching, and for the first time, I'd heard him a couple times before, it all made sense, but not just made sense, it made personal sense. What he was saying about Christ and the need to follow him and that could have the hope of heaven and uh, salvation now and to know God in a personal way where he could lead and guide, direct my life. And I was just like, it's like a light bulb was going on. And so uh, then he offered at the end of that time the opportunity to receive Christ. So I lifted my hand uh, and said, I want to do that. And then he led us in a prayer. And I thought, wow, amen, I did it. And then he said this, doggone it. He said, everybody that Jesus calls, he calls openly and publicly. And so if you prayed that private prayer, I want you to come down to this stage and indicate that you're willing to follow Christ publicly as well. And I thought, well, I'm in the last row. Certainly doesn't mean me. 
to which he said, and if you're in the top row, you better start coming now. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And I remember the words I said. They came out of my mouth. They were resonating in my head because God had been working and hounding me and drawing me toward himself. I stood up and I said, there comes a time and started to walk down that uh, uh, long uh, uh, walk uh, too. It was the beginning of the most amazing dynamic life I could have ever imagined, filled with uh, godly purpose and love and joy in the Holy Spirit. Uh, my only regret in uh, receiving Christ is I didn't do it sooner in life, right? Maybe that's your uh, uh, assessment as well. Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. Uh, I did on that day too. And thank goodness God had appointed that Christian to then help me grow in my faith as well for a long, long season. Well, um, Zacchaeus received Christ, but not everybody was happy about it. You know, when you came to Christ, uh, you may have had some friends around you who rejoiced with you um, and began to cheer you on. But I'll tell you, the Bible says this, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There will be people who stand against you because don't forget, you've now transferred kingdoms and these kingdoms are in conflict with each other. There's no harmonizing them in any way. And for Zacchaeus... Instantly, there are detractors. Listen to Luke 19, 7. And when they, who is they? The religious leaders who were against Jesus at the time. When they saw what was happening, they grumbled amongst themselves. And they said, look, Jesus has gone into the guest, uh, to be the guest of the man who is a sinner. And I'll guarantee you, they never warmed up to Zacchaeus. Well, uh, uh, that's true of him. It's true of you and I. It comes with the territory, but it's always worth it. Um, and so the first thing, God found me. Second thing, I received him. And then the third thing, that my life would never be the same. Oh, I hope that's true for you. You know, I told you in the early years, you couldn't really see what was happening. Um, but one of the greatest compliments you'll ever get is if somebody you once knew before Christ comes up to you later afterwards and says, oh, there's something different about you. What happened? And you're like, no, 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 nothing's different. No, I see it, right? And it might be the love of God shining through your life. It might be the clarity on your purpose. Uh, it could be a number. It could be just godly and holy living. Um, there will be a change. If there's no change in your life, you ought to doubt whether you're in the kingdom of God because... <clears throat> The kingdom of God is radically different than the kingdom of darkness. There is no compatibility uh, for that. And it happened for Zacchaeus immediately. For me, no. It was transitional time, continues to happen today. But look at what happened for him. I know some it's a slower process, but instantaneously, Zacchaeus was different. Luke 19, 8 says this. Zacchaeus grabs a, a wine glass, starts tapping on it. Excuse me, everybody. Let's stop lunch for a minute. I have an announcement to make. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, I uh, love how he says this, behold, Lord. By the way, when he says, Lord, he's saying, Jesus, I am recognizing you as the maximum authority in my life. Behold, Lord, half of all of my goods I give to the poor. What is your net worth right now? I know what my net worth is right now, and I'm not ready to give away $432,000, <laughs> but I would if that's what God called me to. Jesus didn't ask him to. Jesus had asked the rich young ruler to do that. Give away what you have and come follow me. That's still a good trade. It's totally in that rich young ruler's favor. But nobody prompts Zacchaeus an instantaneous response to the salvation happening. He just stands up and goes, I've given half away to the poor right now. And I'm like, wow. And then he goes one beyond that. And he goes, and if I have ripped anybody off, if I've defrauded anybody, according to what he knew, uh, was uh, Exodus chapter 22, if I've ripped anybody off, I will restore it fourfold. That's the law of restitution in the Old Testament. Amazing. It's so obvious what's happening. How has your life changed since you came to Christ? Um, and then Jesus will just capstone it and end our story for us. Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this. In other words, the kingdom of God, new person been added to it, this place, this house, since he, Zacchaeus, now is also a son of Abraham, a son of faith in God. Why? Because the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. What an amazing miracle story. This is a miracle on the proportion of putting a camel through the eye of a needle. 
right? Isn't that how Jesus described it? It would be easier for a rich man to enter kingdom than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And here it was, a very rich man entered the kingdom of God. I wonder why it's so difficult for some to be saved. Probably the same rich and poor, but more so with rich self-sufficiency. Don't recognize our need for a savior. Zacchaeus knew it, and he knew it so well. The kingdoms were raging in conflict inside his heart, and he couldn't wait to get close to someone, anyone, that might be a savior like Jesus, and he met him in a personal way. Let me ask you this, though. Who has God placed in your circle? Your circle of influence who is yet to be translated out of that kingdom of darkness. They're still trapped within it. Is it a friend? Oh, I've had friends uh, that I've known since kindergarten and watched some of them late in life come into the kingdom of light and come into the kingdom. Nothing better than uh, to use some influence that I had to help them do that, to put their hand on the door uh, opening up heaven. Um, Who is it in your life? Is it even a family member? You know, children are not born into the kingdom of heaven, right? I mean, uh, 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 they're stuck in this world. Every parent needs to Share the gospel with their own children or grandchildren. Who is it for you? Because we're going to pray about that at the end of our time together and just allow God maybe to activate us to be that one that helps someone come to faith. Well, that's the end of our scripture proper, but you get a bonus today. Because from the moment that that ended and Jesus left Jericho, conversation started. It would be about a day and a half journey to come up the hill to Jerusalem and enter into it. And they talked about things all the way up that hill. But Luke, the gospel writer, only gives us the capstone, literally the the summary of what they talked about for a day and a half about the kingdom of God. And I want to share it with you because it's an often misunderstood parable. Here it is. Read it with me. It's going to be very fast. It's called the parable of the minas. When you hear the word minas, think of money, the parable of the money. Here it goes. Get ready. As they heard these things, the Bible says, he, Jesus, proceeded to tell him a parable. Why? Because he was near to Jerusalem, so he's almost up to the top of the hill, and because they thought, oh, the kingdom of God is about to appear immediately. How many of you uh, know this, that uh, the disciples had hoped that the kingdom of God would come to earth, and Jesus would set up an earthly reign at that moment, but he did not. That was not his plan at the time. He was establishing first a spiritual kingdom that confused them greatly. So against that kind of thinking, this is how the parable is told. He said to them, therefore, because you think the kingdom is going to be of one type, but it's really another. A nobleman, this is confusing, so I'm going to help you decode it quickly. A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. By the way, your translation may say a man of noble birth. That would be more accurate. Uh, And then calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minas or amounts of money. Uh, He said to them, go do business and engage until it till I come back. But his citizens, catch this, this is interesting. This is not necessarily those that received the money, but it could have been some of those. But overall, his citizens hated him and they sent a delegation after him when he went to that other faraway country and said, we don't want this man to reign over us. A little confusing, isn't it? When he returned then, having actually received his kingdom, he ordered his servants who he had given money to to be called to him that they might know, uh, or that he might know what they had gained in doing business. So this is similar to another parable. It's not the same, but this part will sound familiar. You ready for it? It's giving accounts, right? It's like the parable of the talents, but it is different. The first came to him and said, Lord, your single mina has made 10 more. He said to him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in very little, you have authority over 10 cities. Great. Second, Lord, your single mina that you gave me, that money, it's made five more. He said, good, you're over five cities. All right, this is sounding familiar, right? You're getting it. Then another came and said, Lord, here's your mina. I, I, I actually folded it up and I put it inside a handkerchief. Um, I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. Uh, You take up what you don't deposit. You reap what you don't sow. And he said, I will condemn you with your own words. You wicked servant. You knew I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow. Why didn't you at least then put my money in the bank? Coming back, I could have received some interest. And he said to those standing by, take that mina away from him. Give it to the guy who has 10. Uh, And they said, "But, but he already has 10. 
He says, listen, I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. This is the nature of the kingdom of God, by the way. Uh, and, he, and he says, more will be given. But from the one who has not, because they're not in the kingdom, they're not committed to the kingdom, by the way, even what he has will be taken away. But you remember these others. Do you remember these others? Those that didn't want me to reign over them, bring them here, slaughter them before me. Gentle Jesus. <laughs> this is a confusing parable, isn't it? I can shed a little bit of light on what they understood, but remember again, it's about kingdoms in conflict. There is a terrible kingdom that we were born into, the kingdom of darkness, but we are offered the kingdom of light, of love and joy in the Holy Spirit, the hope of heaven, fellowship of other believers, the presence of God's Spirit. And we're offered everything. The author of Hebrews said it this way, they're in such contrast, he poses a question. Um, it's such a great salvation God offers. How then shall they they escape who neglect so great a salvation? And the answer simply is they will not. About 20 years before Jesus told this parable, something really happened, and they all knew about it who were there. King Herod had passed away in 84 approximately. His kingdom then, he ruled all of Judea, would be left to three of his sons. He had slaughtered some of the other potential people to inherit it. And so one of those three sons was Archelaus. Archelaus was due to receive the Judean kingdom and into Jericho. Um, but he was only noble by birth. He had not been affirmed that kingdom by Rome. The emperor Tiberius would have to grant that to him. And so the story Jesus tells is their story. And so what had happened is Archelaus, to pre-win approval of Caesar, slaughtered 3,000 Jews. 3,000 Jews. And then he got his entourage together to go to Rome to receive his kingdom. But guess who followed him? the relatives of those slain Jews. And they went and they told Tiberius, don't you dare let this man be over us. And Tiberius compromised and he sent him back not as king or Herod, but as a regional ethnarch, something lower. And so the two contrasts are set there. What worldly kingdoms look like and what Jesus was offering and there is no compatibility between the two. You choose one or the other. Either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And Jesus wanted to be clear about it, but it's worth it. There is going to be a day where we're called into heaven and we're going to celebrate what the Bible calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. Have you heard that term before? It's written in the book of Revelation and a couple other spots with Jesus. Uh, it's going to be the celebration where we enter into eternity and we begin to praise God for the fact that we're part of the kingdom of God. And I imagine it this way. How many at Thanksgiving have a table that can come apart and put extra leaves in? Anybody have those? We have that. We have an old table and we put all the leaves in it. And now our family's so big, it's still not enough. So we have to put a card table at the end, right? And that's for the kids, right? The kitty table. Uh, anyway, I imagine the marriage supper lamb is one of those tables like that, but it's so long, it kind of almost fades off the horizon and you're there and I'm there. And you know what we do? We start telling our stories and, and maybe it's Jim, you know, and Jim goes, uh, Lord, I want to praise you because as a, uh, a teenager, you put somebody in my life and it was so-and-so and they led me to faith in Christ. And then I led my kids to faith in Christ and married a godly woman. And oh, you, it just, he made all the difference, but to your glory, God, we all go, oh, praise God for that guy. And then somebody else, you know, you go, oh, you know, I, it was my father. He was the one, him and my mom, they just led us to faith in Christ right from a young child. Oh, praise God for them, you know, uh, and then I'll have my turn and I'll go, oh, I want to talk about Todd. Oh man, uh, 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 God, you placed the perfect person in my life. I was a slow learner, but he stayed with me and he was faithful. And he not only led me to faith in Christ, but helped me grow up in faith in Christ, encouraged me in my faith. And we go, oh, here's the end of it. We'll have all eternity to celebrate those victories in Christ. But we have one fleeting moment to win them. And so I want to encourage you, let's go win them. Would you bow with me? God, our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you have ushered us into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, and it's wonderful, and we're grateful, and may our hearts always feel that way. But God, uh, not just for us. Oh, 
certainly for us, but for others as well. And so we pause for a moment, God, for you to just reinforce within us the answer to who. Oh, who is it that you have given us access to that we might begin to influence, to invite into the kingdom of God? Would you ask God that? Allow him to put a picture in your mind. Oh, whether you're watching online or right here in the building, uh, uh, maybe it's a name. It will be a name that comes to you. God, uh, is it a family member? Oh, it's so hard, God, it seems to be influential with our family members, a parent or a child. Or, But God, uh, um, you've entrusted them to us, and so we want to be able to be the one to have the privilege to lead them safely into the kingdom. Maybe it's a coworker. God, is there a coworker who we might just understand where they're actually at and help them set the pathway to come into your kingdom? God, maybe it's somebody completely different. But God, even as we prayed earlier, we just want to say yes to you. God, if you give us the opportunity, we'll speak for you. We'll be your witnesses in the world. We'll use the gifting and the talents that you've given us to help others come to faith. And God, if you'll do that, oh, we will simply give you credit when we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb and someone, anyone mentions our name, for it's all to your glory anyway. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you. Thank you, Father.